Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final day of the BFI Future Film Festival 2021. My name is Alex, and I am the festival programmer and producer. And today, we're joined by the art department team behind Saint Maud, the debut horror film from writer-director Rose Glass, which has been winning many accolades on the festival circuit in the last year. And today, uh, the team will talk about how they work together to create this bleak uh, world uh, for the big screen, how they um, scouted locations, how they constructed and designed sets and props, and also how they collaborated with the other departments in the film crew to bring um, Rose's vision um, to the big screen. And the session will be hosted by Oliver Kassman, who is the producer on St. Maud. But just before I hand over to Oliver, I wanted to let you know a little bit about how today's session will run for those of you who haven't attended uh, previous um, festival events. So uh, my colleague Zakia will be managing the chat box throughout this session. If you have any questions at all for us about the festival, the upcoming events or the award ceremony tonight, or the more generic questions about the BFI or BFI Film Academy, then please put those in the chat box and Zakia will be answering them throughout the session. Uh, but if you have any questions um, today uh, uh, for our participants or for Oliver, our host, then please put those questions in the Q&A box. And my colleague Winnie is managing those questions throughout the session. We'll devote the last 15 minutes um, of the session to your questions and we'll try to answer as many of them um, as possible. And we've also created a Facebook networking group Group for you guys um, so that you can um, join and share your uh, portfolios and your social handles um, on there. So please do um, join it and, and start networking with each other. Um, and I also wanted to let you know, and many of you always ask in the chat, this session is being recorded and the recording will be posted um, on the BFI YouTube channel in a couple of weeks time. So after the festival and the best way to find out when the recording is available to view is to follow the BFI Film Academy on Twitter and we'll post a little message on there uh, once um, the video is all ready for you guys to watch. And now, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Oliver to introduce you to our lovely panelists today. Enjoy the session. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Kassman. Uh, I'll be hosting this Q&A today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the amazing uh, production design team behind St. Maud. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Paulina uh, Zhezhovska, our production designer. Uh, hi, Paulina. Um, and I'd like to introduce you to Isabel Dunhill, our art director. There she is. Uh, Anna Mould, our set decorator. Hi, Anna. And Alana Byrne, our buyer. Um, hi, Alana. Hi guys. So uh, obviously this is uh, sort of a, a Q and A of two parts. We're going to kind of start off with uh, talking to these guys about uh, their roles in the art department and how they began in the industry um, uh, to give a bit of a window into that process. Um, we're then going to move on to talk about St. Maud specifically and the fabulous work uh, these people did under very testing circumstances and with an extremely mean and bad tempered producer. Um, uh, but before we start, I think uh, Fiona is going to show the trailer for St. Maud uh, in case uh, people aren't aware of the movie. <laughs> Hi, are you Maud? Yes. Dear God, it takes nothing special to mop up after the decrepit and the dying. Can you feel that? Yep, yep, yep. But to save a soul, that's quite something. Bless Amanda's body and bless her mind, which is shrouded in darkness. When you pray, do you get a response? It's like he's physically in me. It's how he guides me. And he's just there. <laughs> he's everywhere. Maud is looking out for me, you see. To save my soul, if I understand correctly. <laughs> You must be the loneliest girl I've ever seen. 
I just want to see you loosen up. I've got more important things on my mind. Ah! Maud, he isn't real. Ah! This is life and death on another level. Oh, yes, of course. Never waste your pain. Never waste your pain. There we are. Uh, looks quite good, doesn't it? Um, so uh, I think maybe let's start, um, Paulina, if I may, start with you. And uh, perhaps you might uh, start just by explaining what a production designer is uh, to you and um, uh, we'll start with we'll maybe just start with defining roles and then we'll move on we'll do everyone and then we'll move on to, to how you got where you are if that's right but it'd be great if you could give us a sort of definition of a production designer. Uh, yeah so production designer is the head of the art department uh, works closely with a director and cinema, cinematographer to define the look and the film uh, feel of the film uh, is responsible for a visual um, concept of the script uh, and to determine and execute the aesthetic of the of the film. And for me, this role is focusing mostly on um, what I said just now, but as well like solving problems about logistic, about bringing vision. Um, uh, together with the budget that we, we have and about communicating with uh, directors, uh, directors, the cinema, cinematographer, the costume designer, producer, and communicating your vision to your art department uh, so they can help you to bring it uh, together. Fabulous, thank you. And um, Isabel, um, art director extraordinaire, would you uh, perhaps uh, explain how that ties in with the role of the production designer and, and what the, the differences are. The art director um, comes on board quite soon after the production designer um, and will help the production designer to crew up an art department. Um, so they'll also be looking at organising the budget in such a way that lays out all of the different categories that needs that, that need to be looked at and will need to be accounted for throughout the film. So they're the first two major things that, that happen and are really in the art director's domain. The, the next is really to look at what's required from the script and from the vision that the production designer has um, and whether it's a loca all locations, whether any of those locations need um, a built aspect some films obviously have um are all builds and in which case it's it's a lot of work but for saint maud in, in, um specifically we had a location which had constructed elements so it was my job as the art director to draw up what those architectural um additions were and to bring on a construction manager who would have their own team who'd be responsible for building um and uh, realizing uh, Paulina's design for the location. Um, and then throughout, it's just being one step ahead of the game really and making sure that everything is organized um, and managed so that it that we don't fall behind and that everything um, runs tickety-boo basically and keeps on top of the budget and makes sure we don't overspend. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. and and. Anna can um, ask you about set decorator because when I when I first started in the business and I first saw all those things and I thought production designer, art director, set decorator, that they kind of all sounded like the same thing to me because you know it's quite something in a way it's quite difficult to distinguish what the different roles are and it's something I'm still learning and so I've been looking forward to this so can you explain if I think of it's broadly speaking we're saying the designer is the production designer is, is broadly speaking in, ch in charge of creating the overall vision and working obviously with the art director in 
how they're going to do that and tweaking it and the art director is sort of running the budget and the staffing of the the art department and realizing that vision how does the set decorator um fit into that that scheme um so then as the set decorator i would come in and work closely with paulina and go through her um visual mood boards and her concepts and um and then I, i'd be in charge of kind of bringing her visions to life and creating the um worlds of the characters whether it's in a in a set build or on location and um i'd be in charge of um the buying team and sourcing um, or furniture for dressing into the sets and any wallpapers and wall treatments and um, anything like drapes and artwork um, and bringing all these things together and then also working with the um, the props team to actually organize and get get everything to where it needs to be on, on in the right time in the right place and um, and making yeah pulling all that together <laughs> great thank you and alana i'm gonna i'm gonna be mean and ask you to define two things because i introduced you as a buyer but on saint maud you were um standby uh art director weren't you so could you possibly explain both those roles <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely i was a little confused as which to speak to but at the <laughs> moment working as a production buyer and actually alongside anna as well so depending on the size of the budget, the production buyer will work closely with the set decorator and set decorating team um, in much the same way that the set decorator will look to the designers brief and boards. The buyer will look to the set decorators yes. boards, boards. And, and sorry, I've got, <laughs> I've got an echo. And we'll, we'll look to the, the budgets also going through the scripts and doing breakdowns of what might be needed on set, especially action props, but then also helping with the dressing of the sets too, setting up orders from prop houses and seeing that through from beginning to end where you might be working with uh, petty cash buyers also to choose the props, put together the orders and then to see that through with the props team in terms of pickups and payment um, with through production. Whereas um, on St. Maud, I was standby art director and that was working more closely with uh, Isabel and Paulina and being the, I guess, the representation for Paulina and her vision on set, whilst also working alongside all of the other departments and communicating clearly with them if anything was to come up, especially with the AD department, with um, scheduling, if there are any changes there, to be able to relay that to Izzy and Paulina. Um, and then working alongside standby prop as well um, to ensure that all of the action props were there when, if and when we needed them. And just to, uh, to make sure that the, the shots were clear and nothing was being seen that shouldn't be really. So yeah, I was lucky enough to have uh, Paulina and Izzy on set as well. We were the location that we shot at. So. That can be quite kind of high pressure, can't it? Because there's, uh, uh, just for the benefit of people who, who might not have spent much time on a set before, there's sort of this moment you, you obviously you get to your location and the art department have already set the location um and you know you're populating it with the actors and and their maybe their hand props are the things that they're actually going to be interacting with as opposed to stuff that's background but uh of course every take and every different setup things move around uh things get moved so you there's this process of checks isn't there where suddenly exactly and and yeah and to, to make sure that you're respecting the other people involved like if if anna set decorator has come in with props and dress the set in a certain way and then depending on camera and lighting we need to move everything around we need to often do a, a quick redress but keep that you know authentic to the original vision as well and in in the shortest amount of time as possible He's uh, getting uh, impatient, and it's uh, it's that, that's that balance, isn't it, on a, on on the actual shooting floor, everyone trying to respect everyone's 
time and space and also work as efficiently as possible. It's quite an, an art in and of itself. Um, I mean, maybe with this this next bit, just talking about how you got to where you are, it might be, um, I'll start with you, Paulina, but then maybe if you guys unmute yourselves and, you know, because I suspect that there's going to be similarities and differences between all four of you as to how you, you know, got into the art department and, and, and the routes you took. Um, but so do feel free to chip in if, if things are kind of ringing true and it's always like that um, or if it, if there was something that was very different that you think people might benefit from from knowing about but Paulina how did you I suppose when did you first decide you wanted to be a production designer when you grew up and, and how did you uh, how did you go about making that happen uh, I studied uh, stage and costume uh, design in uh, Warsaw uh, in Fine Art Academy and uh, it's it came to me quite late. I, I want to switch to uh, to film. Actually, uh, is when I moved to London uh, about seven years ago. I started to um, work uh, with uh, lots of uh, young filmmakers on short films, music videos, later commercials. And uh, while I was still working in in theater, I was doing some productions in Poland. Um, but then I did, like I realized I need to make a decision, and I reckon that I was getting much more work, and I felt like I'm much more fluent within like film language. Uh, so I I did a con conscious decision after like few years. Um, I as, as well like I tried to figure out like which role I should fit in with an art department, and the only role that I could find myself was was designing because that's uh, uh, that came from uh, where I was studying. Uh, so yes, I feel like quite important uh, moment for me when I was when I uh, did few short films uh, with um, collaborating with students from NFTS. And that was for me really eye opening and this collaboration later on um, become friendships and now uh you know I, I kind of like as well move on from short forms to uh to feature films i just ask because um i think uh, i think perhaps a lot of people's first experience of, of of things like you know working with sets and props and costumes and, and design in that sense maybe comes from theater whether they do it at school or or in their spare time or at university or, or or just an interest in it um what what was the main differences did you feel coming from a theater background to film what what was what was the most starkly different aspect to it uh both on a creative and on a kind of practical um, level well definitely through film you see every detail on a screen like you can you can see the smallest thing while in theater you are just confronted with uh, one window where you see the stage and action is happening there so every most of the productions are happening within one uh, one space where you have the set change in in film uh, we have uh, uh, different location uh, which can be like really large amount from from location to uh, to set build and is a much wider spectrum of uh, of logistic involved as well as as detail and I feel like uh, in film we have like so many different genres that we can go through um, and uh, it's a uh, it became much more experimental and uh, you know I, I really love like very strongly character based um, uh, uh, driven uh, films so for me just like this as a medium become much more um, I become much more passionate about it. I could interject here um, just because I've had a similar background um, where I started um, studying uh, for theatre, so as a theatre design student at Wimbledon, um, and I I practiced as a as a theatre designer on small productions for a couple of years, 
But I, like Paulina was saying, I got really frustrated with the fixed view and I realized I was seeing a lot more value in close up, um, you know, with a, with a camera, a design is, is what fills the frame. And so you can really look at detail. And I was, I was missing that quite a lot in theater and getting a bit frustrated by it. Um, so, so, that, so that's what led me to then go on and do an MA in production design at the National Film and TV School, um, which I did for two years. And that's where I learned to do technical drawing, which is quite a big part of the art department is learning to architecturally draw um, because as, particularly when you're working on bigger films, they do build sets a lot more readily because the money's there for a start and it can be quite an expensive procedure. Um, so, so drafting is a, is a big part of the art department, um, like I said, particularly on the bigger films. And that's where I learned to, to draw. And um, I didn't carry on through the kind of bigger film um, ladder. I, I decided I wanted to work on slightly smaller um, productions where it felt a lot more collaborative and the team was smaller uh, so you could connect much much more easily with members of the team. Yeah, that view uh, is something, see that never occurred to me as, as a difference, but of course it makes perfect sense. And, 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 and I suppose um, because you're opening up such a focus on things like props, for just as an example in, in cinema or in, in Maud, we've got all sorts of wallpapers that become very, very significant and some are seen in tremendous detail, very, very close up. Um, uh, the, yes, you're dealing with a, a level of, of, of minutiae that's, that's very compelling. Um, and of course demands an enormous number of creative choices. Um, that's fascinating. I remember your drafting board from the art department uh, in uh, St. Maud, just mystical, beautiful objects that I was very jealous and intrigued by. Um, and uh, I could certainly never do it an, an architectural drawing. Um, Anna, does it does this all kind of stack with you? Were you were you were you also in theatre originally? Um, no, I wasn't. I actually did a fashion degree, um, and I, I mean, I always wanted to do something creative, but I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so I studied fashion promotion and imaging, um, and we did a a film and illustration pathway on that and that became then became my favorite kind of pathway and I did a um put on an exhibition and made this short film about this woman and all her possessions and that kind of got me really into the the film side of it um and so when I graduated I just started doing some work in the art department um and I thoroughly enjoyed myself and um realized that's where I wanted to be and uh yeah, I've just been doing it ever since really. And kind of similar to Paulina doing a lot of music videos and short films and just building my work experience up that way. Um, and then, yeah, you know, working on lower budget things to, you know, work as set deck and also designing things as well, um, rather than on the bigger films, like Izzy said, where, you know, you're a very small fish <laughs> in a very big pond. Um, and again, uh, like on, on St Maud as well, it's, it's nice to have that kind of compacted team because you do become a really like nice, strong little family and you, you're you collaborating and it's it's a really nice atmosphere and it's a really nice um, place to be working in. <laughs> it's been marvel, isn't it? I mean, it's just wonderful. But uh, the, 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 can I just ask in terms of the, when you first start, what's the, What's the, you know, when, when you say you started building up your experience? Oh. oh we lost you completely. Yeah, sorry, the last <laughs> last half of that question. <laughs> no. Not on. Turn off my video. Is that any good? Yeah, the the sound is back. Tiny bit better, yeah. 
was just asking, what's the very first? No. Oliver, we lost you again. How do you how do you get your very first experience of the art department, Anna? Um, well, yeah, I just, when I uh, was coming to the end of, of my university course, um, I just started to email lots of people, um, lots of production designers asking if they were looking for work experience. Um, I must admit, I probably worked for free for quite a long time <laughs> just to get that um, experience, which I think a lot of people do, although they don't seem to anymore. <laughs> but um but yeah, lots lots of free work experience just to be on set. And and that, it was good as well because you just get thrown into doing lots of different things, especially if you're working on something like a music video, you're, um, you're sourcing, you're going to locations, you're, you're prop making, you're doing all these things because the budget isn't there to have that whole team that you would normally have. Um, and one of my very first jobs uh, was on a really, really low budget horror film where it was basically like a designer an art director and like me so it was it was a great learning experience for my first job because yeah I just I just got thrown right in there. <laughs> yeah, that's good it's, it's that's interesting isn't it that sometimes sometimes those jobs that are quite rough and ready and they can't really afford the full team you actually ironically end up with much more experience just because they need you you know your labour that much more whereas maybe on really big films you know, you really are going to be doing something very specific and small and, and not see the, the whole picture so much. Um, Alana, how about you? Did you, was, is, what was your journey to, uh, to Art Department Glory? Yeah, my route in was a little different to the others. I originally studied fine arts. <clears throat> um, so my plan was only ever to have an art practice and be making for myself. Um, when I moved to London about eight or nine years ago, I was practicing, I had a studio and I began to feel like it was quite isolated. Um, and at the same time, I was working in a few different jobs where I was meeting designers and directors and the kind of the, the idea of um, an art department and film, well, I, was, I was made aware of it more so than I, I, I kind of hadn't really fully thought about it before um, and then through these people that I was meeting I started to gain some experience first on feature film and then more like um, short form art films and then that you know once you start doing work and then you meet other people and you get into um, onto different jobs doing different things and in, in much the same way as Anna was saying like kind of doing a little bit of everything and sort of have been navigating my way through the art department over years since, since that time and I've then kind of ended up filling various roles and trying to find what was the right one for me so designing on smaller jobs um, and then a lot of assisting you know doing a yeah complete mix of um, feature film short film um, a lot of promos and commercials, a lot more short form stuff. Um, and just getting a taste for all of the roles really. Um, and then the last couple of years I've sort of just been more focused on set decorating department um, and filling position of production buyer and just getting to really know that role, but obviously, um, see you know you're constantly communicating with all of the other departments or within your own department in different roles so yeah just um continuing that way that's great and, and this kind of question to all of you but you know if you were starting out today as you say and i think you know things change all the time and so i appreciate it but when you when you see people maybe on their first job you know, I don't know whether you have a runner or work experience or, you know, obviously there's things like uh, screen skills, um, but, you know, for every scheme and every, uh, you, you know, specific university course or masters, you know, not everyone can go to film school for, for many very valid reasons. 
Um, not everyone can get into screen skills, which kind of does a lot of the legwork for you. So if you were kind of coming at it from, maybe you went to art school, maybe you didn't, but you're a creative person, you're interested in working in the art department or think you might be, any of you please shout out, but what would you suggest a first step might look like in today's film and TV world? It's, yeah, it's a tough one, I have to say, um, because it's it's very much about who you know, this industry is kind of the worst thing about it is it's kept very much in a, in a close knit um, because of that who you know um, culture. But I would say my, my advice would be is if you can get hold of um, someone, anyone, whether that's someone in a production company or someone who you know, who has a friend that works in the industry and you can communicate with them and really um, get across your, your passion to sort of give it a shot or get your leg in the door, somehow your foot in the door, um, to, just, to, to just make contact. And if the more work you can do with, um, in terms of getting an actual name of someone, it can really help when you're writing emails and stuff, if you can write it directly to someone, because you know, when you send these emails out, um, they can often just get lost with the anonymity of it. Um, so, yeah, don't despair, but but really just try and try and track down email addresses and and start making contact and and yeah, communicate your enthusiasm would be my my, my advice. That's very good advice. I think it's, it's it's difficult, isn't it? Because every every film or TV show it's a brand new undertaking, 95%, well, 100% of the people working on the show are freelance who are actually making it, they're hiring people freelance. And, and I think that who you know, sometimes it can be very problematic. Um, you know, there are genuinely quite poor reasons that that exists. Uh, and those are unfortunate and we, we try and make those better. But it's also just, to a certain extent the thing about time isn't it and and that people you know need someone now they need to know that they're good they need to know that they're going to turn up they need to know that they're going to work hard and so do you think it's uh would you would you would and this is a genuine question because when i'm uh talking to producers or directors um who want to get into the film industry a lot of the time i say you know, you can be going for the internships and the assistant jobs and the master's courses and, and all that kind of thing, but don't forget to also just make films and don't worry if they're bad because it's never difficult to get people to not watch your short film. So if you make some bad work, it's kind of fine because you can kind of just move on quite quickly, but just the more you're making stuff, the more people you meet, the more practiced you become, the more your name gets out there. Does that does that hold true for art department as well, do you think? Or is there an issue with uh, perhaps doing too much work that's not necessarily of the right quality? Uh, I think you were very right what you just said. It's, uh, it's all about experience and as much experience you can gather, you can best understand where you want to land within the art department. And of course, what Isabel said, uh, you just meet lots of people and the connection are really crucial here. Uh, and be persistent and probably trying to, I think like for me was uh, about timing and sort of like be in the right place at the right time, meet the right people. Uh, but I was definitely persistent within on my way um and very excited and um uh, it's all about your attitude so i think that's um uh, definitely if someone is passionate if someone loves film and uh, and trying to get as much experience as possible and finding quickly which role want to uh, fill in uh the doors are open like it's so many fantastic production i think like especially in London, like we, you know, uh, amount of production that are, is happening. So there is so many possibilities um, 
all over and I feel like it's, it's the way to finding them and contacting the people who you want to work with. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think, I wonder if now might be a good time for us to start talking a bit more about St. Maud specifically, just as a, a window into the processes of the art department a little bit more, because I feel like maybe there's people watching who are very certain they want to work in the, the art department and people who are a bit more curious and uh, I don't know, depending on what they hear, maybe they'll, they'll change their mind either way. Um, but um, uh, if Fiona would be so kind, maybe we could have a look at a clip of St. Maud now just uh, to show, ah, here we go. Father, thank you. And bring your hand to join your right hand and then draw a semicircle above your head. Now don't get me wrong, palliative care is noble work. But I always knew you had something more planned for me. It takes nothing special to mop up after the decrepit and the dying. But to save a soul, that's quite something. Your presence graces the air, and I feel fuller of your love than ever before. More than enough to share. Um, so I wonder, maybe we could break it down a little bit. Um, that first opening shot with Maud uh, putting the uh, popcorn kernels uh, on the, the little mat and, and, and making her prayer. Um, it's a fairly, it does, it, you know, at first glance, it's maybe not the most complicated scene but of course it it kind of has everything in it because it's in our main location you guys had to completely redo that room you did the graphics making the popcorn uh, sachets you had real popcorn you had stunt popcorn you had uh all sorts of you know we have uh story lighting in the scene from props we have other lighting etc etc so um I guess, I guess with Maud, it's important that we talk about this house, isn't it, that we shot in. Um, so maybe Paulina, could you tell us a bit about our, uh, our houses in Highgate? Uh, yes, I feel uh, like uh, we've been uh, really lucky because pretty much all our uh, locations we fit into one house, like two houses, because Maud uh, Betsy was uh, literally a house uh, further. Uh, and uh, being all the time on set as a, uh, as a designer is quite a privilege. I feel uh, normally you often never on a set, you have to go and prepare next set. And here we, uh, we got this um, uh, brilliant, amazing location with uh, uh, lots of space which could fit all our needs. Um, of course, we had to start pretty much from, from scratch because there was no floors, uh, no ceilings. Uh, we have to take it as a sort of skeleton and design towards, uh, towards our needs. Um, and uh, on the uh, ground floor, 
uh, where we the whole space was uh, um, uh, uh, just uh, designed for for Amanda. The second, the the first floor was uh, uh, the was designed for for mod in in a way like uh, we I wanted to different differentiate the words that they coming from. So uh, Amanda word was uh, uh, quite. Uh, intense colors, really rich texture. So we we kind of could see her uh, material status, um, uh, where she comes from, um, her artistic background and so on. While the first floor where uh, we have the uh, wallpaper was a, the part of the house that haven't been renovated since um, she moved in so we have old wallpaper everything is much more muted color which as well they relate to mod bedsit in in her flat when she um uh, comes back later uh so uh yes pretty much we had to do everything what we've seen in that house with carpets floors uh moldings uh extra uh, construction to adjust certain spaces for for our needs so yeah it was it was a huge job wasn't it so it was we found these two houses next door to each other these sort of victorian uh, villas very large but had been uninhabited for years and the main house that we shot in had been a, a an old people's home most recently so so that that room, the kitchen, which um, Isabel, I'd love to bring you in on because I mean, you tell me, but from a construction point of view, possibly the, the kitchen had the largest distance to come, didn't it? Because that was more or less just a, well, it was just a white box with uh, a couple of, it had a screen coming out by the door, which we had to, to remove, but it, you know, you guys built that from absolute scratch. Uh, so could you, could you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, the, the kitchen was definitely not a kitchen, as Oliver said. Um, in terms of the construction in that room, it wasn't vast, I have to say, but we did some quite key things, which was to change the doors around. So when we got in there, the doors all opened. Um, so if you imagine you're at a doorway and, the, and most of the room is to your left as you enter and the doors opened uh, left to right so like that which meant if you're working um, with cam with a camera and you're wanting to reveal a room but the door is opening like that you're actually you're closing off your scene which can sometimes work for a narrative but for for us Rose Rose really wanted to to, to reveal the space so quite a lot of our work was swapping doors around which sounds like an easy job but these were like really old doors which had different um, facades on each side so suddenly they didn't work that was the main task and also cutting hinges a nightmare and then um, in in the room we yeah we put a, a whole new floor down so that's all set deck um, so that's Anna's department who, who organized the flooring um, and again putting a kitchen in which is also which was also set deck so they sourced um a kitchen and put that in uh, and and we we painted but the the kind of I, what i would add is in that area downstairs which you saw in the clip that view of the front door our main challenge was to match that to an exterior which was in a completely different place so the exterior house we shot um in scarborough so completely another part of the country and geographically we had to make it work um, inside uh, to what the view of the house looked like from the outside. Um, so we actually had three versions of the house. We had, we had the inside which you saw, you had the close view of the outside which was actually around the back of the house connected to the bedroom and then we had the far view of the house which was in Scarborough. So it's all about piecing together different places sometimes to look like they're all in the same place. 
Uh, so that's what the, the main work was to do. And also to make that downstairs area um, feel a bit grander because it was pretty decrepit, wasn't it, guys? When we went in there, it needed work to sharpen it up and we, we put floorings down. We, we added panelling, that wooden panelling that you saw, we added all of that. So it was, um, Paulina had done these visuals that really created a kind of corridor and um, quite austere um, architecturally um, intimidating space so so we wanted to kind of really work to create that through mirroring this panelling on both sides um yeah I think that's you guys had quite a challenge didn't you because because these houses not only were our heating sets but were also our camera storage our production office our canteen our art department stores are you know everything everyone was kind of crammed and I think as you say when you're looking back at the door on the right is the kitchen that you guys built from scratch on the left is a uh, you built all that wood paneling to mirror the existing stuff on the other side but you were also there was a practical element because you were hiding the fact that all our camera kit was stacked up in there and our sound team and our DIT and everyone um, so you guys had to really work around the fact that we needed to put all this stuff getting in the way of your design. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that is actually one of the key things is when you're, when you're designing a set, you're actually also designing a working space for a whole nother team. So it's a space that's got to work um, for, for the story and for the script, but it's also got to be a space that can be inhabited by a large number of people um, so yeah, you're not only accommodating, like Oliver was saying, the story, but you're also trying to accommodate storage and to try and kind of um, allow spaces to be used for other purposes. And then you get a load of sparks and grips come in with, you know, fuck off stands and, and track and they trash it and then, you know, and it's, yeah, it's, it's very yeah, difficult. I also, I would I would definitely speak to that on St. Maud, especially when it came to um, whether it was on breaks and lunchtime, things like this, and just trying to get everybody to to protect, you know, to be able to protect the set, but obviously to be accommodating to the other departments and realize that they have to put their gear somewhere. Um, and and when we would switch back and forth between the various sets, whether you know if we went into the kitchen, then a lot of the gear would end up in the living room or up to the bedroom same thing and it's just about working closely with everybody so that everyone is respecting one another's work and nothing gets trashed so we're not you know we're not having to buy things again or um have to do major re redresses so yeah yeah it's i i, I tip my hats to you because it's very uh, nightmarish really and 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 anna how do you you know I was joking, you know, casually just put together a kitchen. How do you take a room, you know, that's got absolutely nothing in it and certainly no running water or anything <laughs> like that? How do you build a kitchen? Um, yeah, actually, <laughs> that clip, when I was watching the film with my boyfriend the other day and he was like, wow, um, love that cooker. That's amazing. I was like, yeah, you know, we had to search the whole of eBay and the whole of the country to find an Arga. <laughs> And the prop master hated me because he had to go and collect it and it took hours to take it apart, then load it on the van and hours to put it back together again. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that was that was just the Arga. So, you know, then uh, sourcing all the kitchen units, making sure it all fits properly to the space um, and yeah, running water. There, there wasn't any of that. So getting the props team to kind of rig a little tank in the cupboard so we could actually have water come out. And the same in Maud's bed sit as well. There's a lot of water action from the tap. So we had to rig special things under the cupboard. Um, yeah, so lots of, lots of, um, you have to be good at researching and, you know, be willing to go rummaging quite a lot to find all these specific things. We went to um, the secondhand market quite a lot at the race course. I remember we, Paulina came as well. We were up at five in the morning to uh, go to the market to grab all the bargains, <laughs> especially and that um, the big orange rug in the Amanda's living room as well. Just looking at that in that clip, Pauline was haggling with the guy so that we could get this rug. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> you guys did a bring and but you did you guys did a yard sale at the end, didn't you? I've still. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, beautiful uh, piece. Um, can I ask then, when it comes to more location shooting? Uh, in the truest sense, because because our houses were fabulous and, and we did three and a half out of five weeks there in the main shoot. Um, but of course, we also shot in a in a um, working men's club uh, for the bar scene. And then, of course, all our stuff in Scarborough was exteriors. Um, how do you, does your job develop when you're not building something from scratch and you're working with a pre-existing environment? To what extent do you guys, would you explain how that works and, and, and what you do and what you don't do and, and some of the tensions around that? Maybe Paulina, open the bidding. Uh, so we basically seeing what is on the location and what, it, what we want to use from the location and what we actually lacking. So, um, I feel like in a um, in a pub where we were shooting the scene when the, with with the beer, uh, we pretty much embraced the location. There was lots of decoration which we had to put down because it was much more crowded space, and we had to clean it uh, uh, quite largely. Uh, add quite. A, few hours stuff like make sure there is uh, no graphic that are not cleared in that space because it has lots of uh, artwork on the on the wall so making sure that the the space is prepared for uh, what camera is going to see and we uh, depending on our needs like if we want to have clear background make sure that is clear and whatever it needs to be like certain arrangements of the tables uh, but this location had already so much to offer so for us it was quite easy easy one to work with interesting and then and 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 in the in the scarborough sequences when we were on the beachfront and when we we're on the um yeah on the on, on the beach itself and things like that where does how does how does how does art department sort of engage with those spaces because there's tweaks you know you're kind of constantly having to work but it's not always quite the same is it well i think similarly was in the cafe where uh mod comes uh, to to uh, or, or eat fries and we have lots of mirrors so we make we have to make sure that the camera is not going to be uh visible in that mirror so whatever we can hide, we, we hide. But like, again, we found a really interesting uh, location if with quite uh, uh, striking design, which actually fit perfectly what we needed in terms of colors, in terms of density, in terms of like uh, uh, the aesthetic, what was, uh, what was already there. So again, trying to adjust it for our needs, but embracing as much as it it gives us and like you know th that's that's probably why we're choosing certain locations because they already can offer us so much where we can save so much money using whatever is already there and uh, i think regarding the um, exteriors uh, scabra is quite a um, specific in terms of like density and uh, this loudliness of lights and uh, noise of the um, of the street by the beach where is a uh, uh, which was quite good contrast to the interiors of uh, of Maud and Amanda so that was a uh, quite deliberate choice cool okay i think uh, does anyone want to to jump in add add anything to what Paulina said get into a terrible argument and disagree with her I would just say, um, in terms of working with the exteriors in Scarborough, um, to a certain extent, you, you kind of have to accept what's there and work with camera, especially as standby art director, to say, you know, sometimes it's just a case of shifting the lens slightly, or, you know, obviously, if, it, if it's within our grasp, we'll, we'll clear an area that might, it might involve just having some you know, shovels or, or uh, yard brushes standing by just to, 
to clean up the space but I mean when it comes to like shooting on a beach you're not gonna rake all of the sand so you kind of have to work with what you've got as well I and accept it reminded me of us wetting down the steps in one of those alleyways at one point didn't we um because yeah you go to Scarborough in December you don't think that you're going to have to wet down the pavement but we did so. <laughs> yeah yeah I mean there was a lot of continuity because we I mean we did have a lot of wet days while we were there didn't we so what, what you're referring to was probably yeah the one area that was dry so we'd have to match but it's a light thing as well wasn't it because it was dark we wanted the steps to be wet because then they're more reflective you can it pings a bit more they were kind of it was there was a kind of creative mm -hmm. motivation as well in the, in the, i guess there was just some of those things that feel you perhaps to someone who doesn't know you think well you go to a, a location and that's it that's that's what it is so the art department you know what are they but of course actually you guys are deeply involved with the selection and, and making sure that that fits into the world but then also managing uh, those locations while you're actually shooting continuity and creatively um i wonder i wonder if maybe we uh, open it up to some uh, of the questions that people have kindly uh, been sending how about <laughs> are there any crucial skills you need to develop when working in the art department that's from emily crucial across the board skills i i would say um yeah if you're talking about just a, across the board um then yeah communication and well it's not really a skill but just making sure you ask questions if you're not sure about anything um, I think that's a really important thing. Don't, you know, don't try and think that you might know something or, you know, I've had things in the past where you've maybe asked an assistant to get something and they didn't know, but they didn't ask. So then just a lot of time was wasted and things like that. So yeah, don't, don't be afraid to ask questions and yeah, keep communication strong. So an intelligent question is always better than a stupid answer, isn't it? Um, the, um, there's another question here uh, from, oh, I'm sorry, I can't see who it's from, but, oh, Laura, how do you, did you find out which role in the art department you wanted to do? That's, that's Laura doing my job for me. I should have asked you that at the start. But how do you decide? I'm going to be a set decorator, I'm going to be a production designer, an art director, is it just experience and you seeing those roles being done? I, I think it's, it depends what your sort of primary discipline is. Like from my point of view, I, I came from theatre and I was, I was interested in construction and architecture and all of that stuff was something I was interested in anyway. So um, I also work as a production designer on small, on short films and stuff. So I've, I've kind of done that. I, I'm doing that role as well. Um, but I, I, I like the art director role because it, yeah, it, it harks for me back to that architectural interest that I have as well. And I have to say for me, um, set decorating is so crucial, but I, I I couldn't do it. I don't. It's just not me. I think it's it involves such an a sort of um, a character led decision process. You have to be really, really in tune with what each furn what each item is saying about a character. And for me, I prefer the broader brushstrokes of art directing, which is more the kind of behind the the character dressing, I suppose. Very interesting. Anyone else? How did you, well, let's say conversely then, Anna, how did you decide to be the set decorator and, and with that level of specificity, as you are saying? Um, yeah, I think I think just from experience, really, because, yeah, when I did start, I didn't, I didn't know, I, I knew I was interested in the art department, but I didn't know, I was still learning all the roles and everything. So, yeah, it's definitely something I've, I've kind of learned and, and I, I could definitely 
not do art directing. I'd, <laughs> you know, I'd, I've been art director on a couple of things before, but it's definitely not me. And then when I see Isabel working as art director, she's totally <laughs> in the zone and, and where she should be. So, um, it, yeah, it just uh, I think and then also just working on those smaller projects and when you are going around sourcing and looking at all those little things that make up the set that's what I did enjoy the most and that's so that's yeah why I'm, I'm in this department. <laughs> um, Alana I'm going to ask you start start off with you a, a question from Joanne uh, uh, what was it like working on such a morbid project? It's a question <laughs> of that. <laughs> It was, was it like really, really lovely. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it never felt morbid on St. Maud actually, because the team, the crew of people that we had were just so great. And we had, we had really, really lovely community feel on set. Um, and I think that probably was par it, partially because we were all in such close quarters. Um, but I think, you know, yeah it was just everybody who was involved you know and that from the top down especially with Rose and her approach and yourself and Andrea and Paulina and everybody it was just yeah the the, <laughs> the working on something that was thematically so morbid it oftentimes just became humorous because we were all getting I felt like we were all getting on so well um, and yeah, we were we were just trying to to really aid Rose in her vision, um, and yeah, it didn't really like every now and then we, we would stop and think, oh God, per Maud, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we really really developed a real empathy for her. But then uh, Morphid, uh, who was playing the character, was just so much fun off screen and the complete polar opposite to Maud's character. So I think that it sort of cut through any of that grimness <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean i mean it was always nice you know we were always trying to foster certainly a, you know a kind of happy environment but of course you know i always credit uh Mordebev and, and and jennifer ely mm -hmm. uh, a lot because they you know your lead actors set 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 so much of the tone as well on the floor and uh, they were so lovely um, absolutely and so it, talented that like we were all just sort of completely distracted by their acting capabilities that we um yeah you almost forget about this. you're just really in the moment with it which was lovely and Paul Morford, there's you know it it, it, it kind of go when you've got the director just hunkered down by the camera behind the camera <laughs> flicking blood into the lead actor's face and whatever that's either going to be something that they kind of start getting quite cross about all that everyone laughs at. Unfortunately, Morpeth has such a sense of humour that we were just all kind of giggling. <laughs> uh, a little. Yeah. And when you see it in the film, it's so terrible. Um, but yeah, no, I, it, 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 I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's still a happy memory. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to do a couple of just really slightly quick fire ones, if I may. Um, so I'm going to fire them out. Uh, Jess asks, "What are the key software uh, use key softwares that you use in the art department?" That might be one for Paulina or Isabel a bit more. Uh, I uh, on Saint Maud, for example, I work lots with SketchUp. As actually, we had like very quick turn around. I came quite late on the project and everything has to like all the decision had to be done very quickly pretty much straightforward when we when our department started to allow construction to uh for for the build so have the time and i'm finding sketchup very often the quickest way to communicate with the art director um, so I do like using uh, SketchUp and Photoshop, uh, but I do like sketching as well. So just a notebook and pencil. And Isabel, how about you? What, what, what were you using? Um, so I was using a program called Vectorworks, which is a, um, yeah, it's like a computer um, 
aided design uh, program. So it's drawing, it's like CAD basically, but slightly more film tailored. Great. And then this, this is something, and actually I need to ask Paulina, I need you to send it to me because I'm obsessed with this, but um, uh, Elspeth asks, how do you find the right color scheme? St. Maud has a great color palette. I don't know if you've still got a color palette, but I would love a St. Maud color palette because I'm obsessed with them. Uh, yeah, color palette. It, it was interesting discovery because uh, I feel like when Anna uh, came to me with uh, wallpaper samples, everything all of a sudden started to be really clear for me, and especially the wallpaper in uh, Amanda's bedroom, which I constantly fall in love. And uh, and that that as a centerpiece because uh, uh, small anecdote that we couldn't actually afford enough wallpaper within our budget so we we decided to um, to paint the living room but I designed the moldings um, uh, there to break the the large space it was like ten meters long long room so we uh, break it down a little bit but the the wallpaper for um uh, uh for amanda was like a initial um color palette for that space and with mod everything i wanted to go with very muted color very uh uh dusty sort of uh grayish beige uh, things that feel almost boring that she's not uh she's trying to f like really fit in within uh within the surroundings of herself so everything has this this green and it's not really um specific so like the bedroom upstairs and her uh, bed seat was with the similar color palettes um, yes i mean please do send me a color palette from St. Maud because I would love it. Um, uh, I'm going to ask, okay, so one for all of you. Uh, Naomi asks, what genre of film do you prefer working on and why? Let's go, so we'll start with Anna. Uh, <laughs> uh. I mean, well, I kind of anything with a bit of a, a period is very exciting. Um, I do also like horror. I've worked on a few horror films, um, and they're they're always very good. So I, yeah, I'd say horror. And why? Why? Why horror? What's the artistic? Um, what well, I worked on one a long time ago, and it it was just really fun making all the really gruesome stuff. Um, and then it's it's really nice to then see the audience reaction to something because you're like, oh, that was really just like chocolate brownie or something, you know, something really silly that but the audience are like, oh, that's horrible. And and like with St. Maud as well, but the, I remember the pins in the shoes, watching that moment, it's like, ah, but, you know, knowing how what was behind it and how we did it, it's, yeah, that was really enjoyable. <laughs> I was, I was, was, I was kind of upset in the edit because we, you guys did do the pins so that she could put her foot in and press down on them all in one shot, and we did do that shot. And then when it came to the edit, we ended up cutting away, so it looked like she put the things in, and then we'd cut back to the shoe and obviously mm -hmm. taking them out. But in fact, the thing she put in is in there when she puts her foot in. It's just that you guys have treated it. So I, I was I was disappointed because I thought that was a really neat trick you guys did, um, uh, and it wasn't shown off in the best way. But you know, I, such such is the way of things, I suppose. Um, uh, Alana, what's your favourite genre to work in? Um, I'm still making up my mind. You know, I'm kind of surprised each time, like with something like Saint Maud, um, or you know, the idea of working on um, the horror. Or something gruesome like that is like I never I never really saw myself doing that or enjoying it whereas yeah it is really fun when you when you get to uh play and and do these tricks trick your audience um and do it successfully to create that reaction 
things like comedy can be a lot of fun when you're working on set, you know, depending on the script and, and the actors. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think going for, yeah, I suppose drama um, appeals to me. And like Anna said, anything that's period, because of course, if you're working in the set deck department, especially, then it's quite fun because you can, I mean, there's a lot of research involved, but you can have a lot of fun in, in sourcing props and um, and wallpapers and, and drapes and things like this. So, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, similar uh, to Alana, I can't my, make my mind up uh, about the genre, but I really want to connect with the story. So for me, the most important is if I read the script, I don't think about the genre, what genre it is, but I think, did I connect with the story? And did I have a strong vision how this piece I want it to look like? So I rather make a decision Base, based on the script and if I am interested in helping to tell this story. Uh, but definitely drama, horror, comedy, that's, that's something, especially like at the moment, horror uh, genre is blossoming. And uh, like amount of scripts I read recently, <laughs> which are horror, it's, uh, it's quite mind blowing. Uh, so yes, I feel like there is lots of fun working on, on horror. Isabel. Um, yeah, still, I don't have a, a mad preference really, but I suppose in terms of for my job where where we have to do builds, it's really fun because there's um, lots to get stuck into. So um, action films are also quite good because they, they often involve um, destruction and recreating landscapes that have been completely you know, bombed out sometimes. So the challenge of trying to reconstruct um, sort of, yeah, decrepit buildings is really good. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily like working on the films. I, I don't like watching the films I work on always. So sometimes the best ones to work on are not always the best ones to watch. <laughs> Very true. And um, then one for any of you, from Anonymous, uh, have there been any disasters when working in the art department? And if so, how did you overcome this? So any uh, story you feel able to share of a particular disaster, apart from, you know, working with me? Um, uh, anyone, anything that they can share? Or is I it would just... I would just say that like without referring to any one particular disaster I feel like working in the art department over the years is just like there's just a series of constant like potential mini disasters that everybody sort of groups together to to make sure that they they don't occur you know or or comes in and saves the day just before they do um but none no like sets falling on top of crews and things like that no I'd second that it's definitely about mini firefighting you have to really like that adrenaline like oh my god are we going to be able to get this thing in the that small amount of time there with all the odds against us and it's raining and it's meant to be sunny and you know you have to enjoy that adrenaline filled fight to try and win um anna paulina last words um, I just kind of copy what Alana and Izzy just said. Really, it's just yeah, there's always there's always something, um, but we always manage to solve it. Uh, I said I I did a short film a long time ago, and we realised at like nine o'clock the night before that we were missing a massive tree trunk as part of the set, and um, we luckily we were in a, a smaller studio at Shepparton, and we were running around and. Um, nearby was a prop maker studio and they randomly had some polystyrene tree trunks so we managed to pick one up and put it into our set and that was yeah that I think that was the uh, scariest moment of my life. Uh, again I, I totally agree with girls like there's lots of small disaster 
like uh, behind every corner so i don't know like sometimes i have to repaint the whole set like half an hour before we shooting which you're like okay let's let's just do it let's just get on with it later on like you you're trying to dry everything up but uh, uh end of the day it's it's always working out and uh, yeah just to be prepared for uh the worst uh, the worst can happen and try to prevent it yeah great well uh thank you guys i think we're kind of out of time uh so uh i'm going to hand over to alex who i believe will be wrapping up the session yes um thank you so much oliver thank you um all the panelists that discussion was really really great i hope you guys learned a lot i can see there are so many questions the over 100 questions but um oliver i think you did a great job of um asking as many as you could in the short time that we had so thank you um just before you go everyone i wanted to ask you to please please uh fill in um our festival survey and let us know what you thought of this discussion what you thought of the festival in general and how we can improve our online events going forward that's really really helpful um zakia will post the link to the survey in the chat box but it will also be sent to you um by eventbrite after this um session is over and next up we have an event at 6 p.m that's been um curated and produced entirely by the bfi film academy young programmers so all young people age 16 to 25 um the event is called let's talk about sex baby and um, you can still register for it on eventbrite i think Zakia will post that link in the chat shortly as well. And for those of you who have been asking, we'll open our applications for um, Film Academy Young Programmers in late spring. So do sign up for our newsletter uh, to be the first to know when those applications open, or you can just uh, keep an eye out on our Twitter because we'll be posting there about that as well. And for all of those who um, asked about this recording, yes, this session has been recorded and we'll upload the, um, the video to the BFI YouTube channel in next couple of weeks. Again, we'll let you know on Twitter uh, once that's up there for you to view. Um, that's it, everyone. One more event to go. Uh, and then it's our award ceremony at 7.30 p.m. And all the short films in the uh, Future Film Festival program, you can still watch for free on the BFI player until midnight tonight. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a lovely evening. Bye.